Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you, and especially if you're relatively new or brand new, you're very welcome here. So if you've been here this year, if you've been journeying with us since the start of this year, you might know that we've been doing two sermon series so far. We had a sermon series of hashtag more, uh, where we saw that through Jesus, God uh, can and has done abundantly, exceedingly more than we can ask or imagine. And we've been looking at how God is calling us to more in many different ways in this season as a church. But we've also been doing a series on eating with Jesus. And uh, we've had three of those series so, sermons so far, and today I'm going to be wrapping it up. Um, the first two Eating with Jesus sermons, Jono navigated us through sections of the Gospel of Luke. And you might remember how he pointed out that in Luke, very often Jesus is either on the way to a meal, or he's at a meal, or he's coming from a meal. And I think it just speaks of how relational Jesus is and the intimacy that he desires for us. In the first of those sermons, uh, we saw how Jesus dined with tax collectors and other so-called sinners. And we saw how he met them just where they were at and he called them to follow him. And then you might remember the second sermon where we saw, we saw him at the house of Simon the Pharisee. And it was at that table where a so-called sinful woman came, perhaps a prostitute, but it's not clear. It doesn't say that explicitly, but people regarded her as a sinful woman. And she came to the feet of Jesus and she washed his feet with expensive perfume. And we saw that she loved Jesus so much because she knew she'd been forgiven so much. And we learned from her that it's not so much how sinful we are that matters as much as how well aware we are of our sinfulness. And then in the third sermon, we saw Bongani took us to the book of Revelation. And he gave us a foretaste of the great banquet that God will one day host for us in celebration of the wedding supper of the Lamb. And that was a real feast, as you can remember. And today, as we wrap up the series, we, we're going to go to another meal, uh, to another feast, and to another table. We're going to go to the communion table. That's where we're heading today. We wrap it up at the communion table. But on our way there, we're going to go to another feast, to another meal first. We're going to go to a wedding that took place in Cana of Galilee. So it's going to be a bit like an eat and run, right? We're going to go to the one meal on our way to another meal. And, and just another plug, as I say, that side plug for Eat and Run. Sign up as hosts, start getting psyched, start posting on, on the socials, uh, get excited for Eat and Run. But let's dive into our own little Eat and Run in the book of John, chapter 2, where we read about the wedding in Cana. Let's read together. I'm going I'm to read from the Christian Standard Bible. It should be up behind me. Uh, turn to John, chapter 2, if you have a Bible with you. And we're going to be reading verses 1 to 11. Let's read together. John 2, verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. Note how wide the invitation goes. It seems as if Jesus' mother was the one who was the primary guest, perhaps the closest to the family, but Jesus was invited, and by extension, all his disciples. So this is a wide invitation. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked, my hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now, six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. By the way, those are big jars. That's about 100 liters, give or take. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. 
when the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine. He did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first, then after people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray together and ask for God to help us here. Our Father, as we read and consider your word this morning, we ask that we would encounter Jesus. Lord, we come to you as hungry and thirsty people, desperately in need of your touch. We are in need of an encounter with the living God. So this morning, Lord, would you give us real food and real drink to meet our need? So Lord, help me to speak clearly and faithfully what is in your word and on your heart. And Lord, help all of us by your spirit uh, to respond, to see Jesus more clearly. Would you reveal his glory to us this morning and help us to respond in faith and obedience? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, it's well known. It's quite a well-known miracle. But what does it mean? I think it's less clear or less well-known. What is the significance of this miracle? So a few options. Could it be a party trick? Is this just Jesus' party trick? Um, you know, Jesus did many miracles. He healed people. He made blind people see. He raised people from the dead. And maybe this is just one of his more shallow miracles, right? It's cool. It's water into wine. We can all have a party. Maybe, but I don't think so. And partly why is because in the end, the bridegroom gets the credit. So Jesus is not trying to steal the show or be the center of the party. So probably not just a party trick. Second possibility of the significance of this passage is that this passage teaches us that it's okay for Christians to drink alcohol or wine. Now, maybe there's an implication there. Like, yeah, probably if it was strictly forbidden to ever drink alcohol, like Jesus might not have done this. But I don't think that's really the big point. That's not really what the author John is trying to teach us here today. So let's move on to some more promising possibilities. Is it possible that Jesus, through changing water into wine, is demonstrating his creative authority over the universe all the way down to the atoms and the smallest particles? Possibly he is revealing himself as the one by whom all things were made, as John said in the previous chapter, that by him all things were made and nothing that has been made has been made except through him. I think there is some of that going on there. But I think there's more. A fourth possibility of the significance of the series is that Jesus, by his presence at this wedding and by performing a miracle at the wedding, is affirming the institution of marriage as a beautiful and good institution. You might uh, be familiar with these words from the start of a wedding. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the presence of God to witness the joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Jesus Christ adorned this manner of life by his presence and first miracle at a wedding in Cana. That familiar? Now, I'd say yes, it is true that that does affirm the institution of marriage. But I'd, I'd want to take that line of thinking a little further and extend it and say that this miracle might even go further and explain the real meaning of marriage might go even further than just affirming marriage. It might even give us some insights into what marriage is really all about. But even then, I think there's more. I think there's more going on here. Because this is the first of the seven signs in the Gospel of John, which reveal who Jesus is. It's the number one sign, the first sign. And John ends the passage by saying, he thus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Yeah. That's, that's dramatic. So this is not just a party trick or a teaching that it's okay to drink. There's a lot going on here. What exactly is it about Jesus that his disciples believed in? What exactly did he reveal about his glorious identity? 
I think to grasp more of the significance of this passage, we need to get a little bit into the head of John, the author here, because the way John writes is a little bit like the way a master winemaker makes wine. You see, wine is made of grapes. <laughs> it's made of grapes, but there are hints of so much more. If you're a wine connoisseur, you'll know that you can taste and smell berries, vanilla, smokiness, meaty whiffs, freshly cut grass, chocolate, minerals, every kind of fruit and spice you can imagine. A good wine tells a detailed story. It tells you about the soil where it comes from, the climate where it was made, the winemaker's approach to making wine. Wine can be described as complex, as athletic, as precise, chiseled, big, round, bold, structured, unassuming, and so much more. But maybe you're that person who's like, ah, I'm thinking it's grapes. I'm, 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 getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting some grapes here. Maybe you are that person. Okay, there's grace. But for today, you can, you can be that person, but for today, let's look at John's writing more like a wine connoisseur would look at a fine wine. Because, yes, it's a historical account. The details are true. They actually happened. It is made of grapes. But there's so much more going on with John's writing. The details John includes are very intentional. Every detail carries significance. He writes with resonance with overtones, with symbolism. He drops hints and allusions to Old, Old Testament stories, Old Testament themes, Old Testament characters. He drops clues about things to come later in his gospel. So I think we need to spend a bit more time here and see what else we can pick up on the, on the nose, if you will, of this passage. So let's look more closely at the interaction of Jesus with his mother. Let's go to that interaction because it's a strange interaction, especially the way Jesus responds to her. It's, it's a bit strange. It's a bit surprising. But very often with the Bible, when there's something that's a little strange or doesn't quite make sense initially and in your devotion, you might just skip ahead. It's usually where the gold actually is. So let's look at his interaction. We read that when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him they don't have any more wine. So the wine has run out. Mary seems to know this before it's become public knowledge. And she goes to Jesus and she tells him, hey, the wine has run out. You see, this is a catering disaster. This could put a real dampener on the wedding, could make the groom look bad. But to get deeper for a moment, you know, the Jewish people at this wedding would have been aware that an absence of wine at times in the Old Testament is a it's an ugly picture of the lack of God's presence and blessing with his people. Just as the presence of, of an abundance of flowing wine is sometimes a picture of the presence of God and of his blessing upon his people. So it's not creating a good picture. It's a potential disaster. And she goes to Jesus and she, she tells him this. It's not clear to me whether she's already kind of hinting that he must do something about it or whether she's just telling him. But clearly, Jesus interprets it as a request to do something. He's operating on another level. He's definitely thinking there's more going on here. And his response is a bit strange because he, he pushes back. He pushes back to his mother's request. And he says, what is this concern of yours to do with me, woman? My hour has not yet come. I find the response strange because he appears to resist the request, but then he immediately goes ahead and does a miracle and makes the wine. So, so what is he really saying? It begs the question, what hour is he referring to? What, what time is Jesus talking about that has not yet come? And, and how does it relate to the wine running out here? So some possible interpretations of, of why Jesus responds as he does. I think firstly, he might be saying, it's, it's not yet time to draw attention to myself through miracles like solving this wine problem. Or, or to put it differently, it's not yet my time for public ministry. You see, this miracle is the start. It does mark the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, at least in John's gospel. And, and up until this point, his, the fullness of his identity was somewhat hidden. 
I think his mother would have known more. She would have had more insight because she would have remembered the dreams when she was pregnant. She would have remembered the visits of the Magi and the shepherds and the prophecies and the gifts. She, she, she would have, I mean, after all, she, she was a virgin <laughs> when she gave birth to Jesus. So, so she knew there was something special about Jesus. So she knew he could have done something to save the party. And so maybe Jesus is like, like, mother, you know, it's not yet my time to fully reveal who I am. But then by saying that, by saying it's not my time and then going ahead and doing it. So maybe it's Jesus' way of saying like, now is the time. Now is the start of my public ministry. Like up until now, it has not yet been, but now is the start of, of the time where I start to reveal who I am to the world. And I think that is uh, consistent with John saying that he thus, this was the first of his signs. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples uh, put, put his, his, their faith in him. But even if we interpret it this way, what exactly is it about his identity that he reveals? Who does he reveal himself as? All right. So, and, and that for me leads to a second interpretation of what he means by my hour has not yet come. And for me, it's actually the most obvious interpretation that when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, he's kind of saying, this is not my wedding day and I'm not the bridegroom today. The bridegroom is responsible for providing the wine. So why do you involve me? I'm not the bridegroom today. You see, the bridegroom is the one responsible for providing the wine. How do I know this? <laughs> A guilty party laughs. It happened to me. It happened to me. My <laughs> wedding ran out at our wedding. The, the wine ran out at our, at our wedding. And when it happened, uh, I'll be honest, the photo shoot was not even complete the reception had not even begun. It was just the pre-drinks. So, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what that says about my friends. Um, but when it happened, when it happened, the wedding coordinator knew exactly who to come to. And they came to, to me during the photo shoot and they said, unfortunately, the wine has already run out. And so what did I do? Well, I said, all right, take six stone water jars. No. <laughs> No, 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 I didn't say that. I said, sure, uh, it's unfortunate. Please add, please buy another 15 or 20 bottles from the venue and add it to the bill uh, and to all that we've already spent on this wedding. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, the point is they knew to come to, they came to me, the bridegroom, and I made a plan. We made provision for the wine. The head waiter knew that and went to the bridegroom immediately afterwards and said and congratulated him on this wonderful new wine. So, so, so when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, he's really saying, this is not my wedding. I'm not responsible for providing the wine. But he then does provide the wine, and in a miraculous way. So I think he's saying, I am the bridegroom. Or rather, I am the true bridegroom. It's interesting that he lets that bridegroom get the credit. He lets him get the credit for that wedding, perhaps demonstrating that he's pointing ahead to another wedding where he is the true bridegroom. Two weeks ago, Bongani preached about that wedding. He preached a whole sermon about the wedding supper of the Lamb. So we know already as Roots of Fellowship that a day is coming when Jesus will be revealed as the true bridegroom to his bride, the church. And it's actually not surprising that Jesus would do a miracle like this while at a wedding. Because every marriage and every wedding is actually a picture of Christ in the church. Yeah. In Ephesians 5, Paul is busy giving instructions to husbands and wives as to how they should love each other. And then he interrupts himself and, and stops and says, uh, this is actually a great mystery because I'm really speaking of Christ in the church. So you think he's talking about marriage, and he's like, I'm, I'm speaking actually about Christ in the church here. And if the Bible teaches that marriage is a picture of Christ in the church, then Jesus knew that better than anyone. Yeah. And so he took the opportunity while at a wedding to reveal himself as the true bridegroom. Jesus is many things to us. We think of him in many ways. He's the Lord. He is Savior. He's King. He's Shepherd. He's a great high priest. He's our friend. He's our older brother. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. 
He's many things. But I wonder, do we think of him enough as the bridegroom? It's interesting that Jesus speaks himself in that way quite a lot, actually, across the Gospels. The number of the parables and and the way he reveals himself, it's all about the bridegroom and his people waiting for the bridegroom. And if the whole of history, which began with the wedding of Adam and Eve, is, is culminating in the wedding supper of the Lamb, if that is the fulfillment of the ages, the union of Christ and the church to be celebrated forever at the wedding supper of the Lamb, then I think this aspect of his identity is quite central. And we, should, we would do well to think of him more as the true bridegroom. Yeah. So, so let's just reflect just for a moment and, and think about what does that mean for us? If Jesus is the true bridegroom, how does that change or influence the way we relate to Jesus? And I want you to just, just think about it for a moment for yourself at a level of personal intimacy and relationship with Jesus. What does it mean to you? How does it affect the way we feel towards him and the way we think he feels towards us? How does it affect your view of the church as his bride? How does it change your perception of the time period we currently live in? Waiting for the wedding. How does it affect your view of marriage? Maybe it's a a bit of an aside, but, but I think that this gives us a bigger picture of marriage. Like, Marriage is about so much more. It's really pointing to Christ and the church uh, and the hope that we look forward to. But interestingly, as, at the same time as it gives us a bigger picture of marriage, it also kind of puts marriage in its right place because human marriage now, if it's not the real and full marriage, it's not itself the thing that's going to fully and ultimately satisfy. Yeah. And I think that can set both married people and single people free from the burden of feeling like my marriage has to ultimately satisfy or I absolutely have to get married because it's an ultimate thing. It's actually not. It's something that points to the ultimate thing, which is our union with Christ. But there's still more in this text. There's still more to detect on this fine wine of of this passage. John not only reveals Jesus here as the true bridegroom, But he gives us a few hints at how Jesus, as the bridegroom, will make provision. There are hints. There are hints in this passage of how he makes provision as the bridegroom. The first hint is right at the start of the passage. When did this wedding take place? On the third day it took place. There's a gasp. It happened on the third day. Now with any other writer... This could just be a random detail. (laughs) With any other writer, it could be a random detail, right? But not with John. Not with John. He's way too intentional for that. John loves numbers and symbolism and repeated phrases. He loves that stuff. Yes, it is when it happens. Wine is made of grapes. But, But can you think of anything else in John's gospel that happened on the third day? Can you think of anything else in the Christian faith that happens on the third day? The, the clue is that we're going to celebrate it this year on the 9th of April. <laughs> but okay, let's say you don't buy the third day thing. That's a bit of a stretch. You're not, you, I don't smell that. Um, okay, the really big clue is in the use of the phrase, my hour. When Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, there's a massive clue being dropped there by John. Let's have a look at how this phrase is used elsewhere in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 7, so they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. In John 8, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. John 12, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. John 13, 
now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. So what is this hour? Surely it is his crucifixion where he was sentenced to death and died on the cross. And Jesus says to his mother, he says, why, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. It is true. The moment for him to make provision through his blood for his wedding had not yet arrived. It was coming later. But in doing this miracle, he shows us not only that he is the true bridegroom, but he foreshadows the way in which he's going to make provision as the bridegroom. He foreshadows how he's going to do it. Another hint is the detail that Jesus uses six stone water jars that had been set there for Jewish purification. Some people think the number six is significant, being one short of seven, and seven in the Bible, and especially in John's writing, is representative of completeness or perfection. More obvious, though, these jars formed part of the Jewish regulations for cleansing and for purification, regulations or provisions for dealing with sin that had come through Moses and through the law. And it seems significant that Jesus, by creating new wine in these stone jars that had been set there for purification, he's busy in some way replacing or maybe upgrading the old order with something better. In the previous chapter in John 1, we read, For the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And by the way, some people pick up very strong hints of Moses in this text. Uh, the first, for instance, the first of the ten plagues or the first of the, the ten signs of Moses was to change water in the Nile River into blood. And here the first sign of Jesus is to turn water into wine representative of his own blood. And so maybe this is Jesus in some way hinting or revealing himself as the true Moses is the one who would lead his people out of sin and death and into the promised land, as the one who would usher in a new covenant in his own blood. And so at the wedding in Cana, we see Jesus here thinking and looking ahead to his own wedding and about what he would have to do to make provision. That amazing wedding feast of the lamb that Bungani spoke about in great detail, going into detail of all the food and what would be there. Jesus knew that for that day to be a reality, he was going to have to make provision. And just think about how great his provision is. Firstly, his provision is abundant. Jesus filled these six stone water jars to the brim. And each jar contained 20 to 30 gallons. So if we do the maths, that's about 750 bottles of wine. It's a lot of wine. I, I had to, when my wine, my wine ran out, I had to buy about another 15 or 20 bottles. And sure, it was a COVID wedding, but uh, so it was maybe a bit smaller, but still, 750 bottles is, is abundant provision. The wine didn't run out again after that. And we also see that his provision is better. It's better than the old. The head waiter praises the bridegroom saying, everyone sets out the fine wine first, but you have kept the best till now. For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus knew, as Hebrews 10 says, that it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And that the only way to make us holy once and for all was through the provision and sacrifice of his own body. Jesus, as we saw earlier, God in Jesus gives us his first and best. Jesus' provision is abundant. It is better. And it was costly. 
Paying for a wedding is costly with all the different details that go into it, especially when you add in Lobola. <laughs> and we see here Jesus caters for the food and the wine, but he also pays the ultimate bridal price, the ultimate Lobola. In Ephesians 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So going back to Jesus' response to his mother, listen again. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? My hour has not yet come. Do we perhaps detect an echo of the same troubled anguish that occupied Jesus' soul on the night that he was betrayed? That night in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sweated drops of blood and prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Was Jesus maybe at Cana looking ahead and thinking about the price he would have to pay? See, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus was at the table eating with his disciples and he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And so today there's an invitation to come to this table, to the communion table, where we take bread and we take wine or grape juice and we do it in remembrance of the body of Jesus broken for us and his blood shed on the cross where he made provision for his union with his bride, the church. I'd like to invite the band to come up as we, as we wrap up. As we wrap up the, the series on eating with Jesus, I want to reiterate the invitation. The invitation has been there throughout to come and to eat with Jesus, to come to him and to feast. In Revelation 3, Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So come. Come to the communion table. This is the table that makes all the other tables possible. It's through this table that the sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet was forgiven so much. And it's through this table that we also can be forgiven much. It is through this, this table here that God prepares a table in the presence of my enemies in Psalm 23. And at the cross, Jesus defeats the enemies of sin and death and Satan. This table makes that table possible. It's because of this table that we can look forward to the wedding supper of the Lamb. The most epic wedding that's going to go on for eternity. It's possible because the Lamb was slain. I think it's significant that it's the wedding supper of the Lamb, not, not the wedding supper of the King or the Savior. It's pointing in his identity that he made it possible. In the throne room of heaven, all the saints and all the angels sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. They sing, you are worthy because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Fellow believer, your place at the wedding supper of the Lamb at that table is guaranteed because of this table. And through this table, we also enjoy restored fellowship with each other. In Ephesians 2, we are taught that Jesus Christ, through his blood, destroyed the dividing wall of hostility, not only between us and God, but also between us and one another. 
that he destroyed the hostility between Jew and Gentile, between people and people groups, and he created one new humanity in Christ Jesus. And that is why, as Rooted Fellowship, we believe that not only do we embrace and reflect and enjoy the diversity of our context, but we transcend that, creating one new community in Christ Jesus. We can enjoy fellowship together at this table this morning as we together share at this table. We can enjoy fellowship in our homes. We can enjoy fellowship at Eat and Run because of this table. He has made reconciliation possible. And in, in our world with its brokenness and with our history, it shouldn't have been possible. But it's possible because of this table. And so the invitation is wide open. It is open to everyone here. We must respond. Jesus has revealed his glory to us. Are we going to respond like the disciples and believe in him? At Rooted Fellowship, we practice an open table. What that means is that if you are a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, and if the sacrifice he made on the cross is something that you trust in for your forgiveness, for your rightness with God, then you are welcome. Even if you are a visitor here today, you're welcome to join us. But if you don't believe that yet, uh, then it, it wouldn't really carry the same meaning. And we ask that you would rather refrain from participating. But it's also possible that maybe for the first time you feel prompted to take that step of faith and to believe in Jesus. And that if that is you, then it's a great opportunity. It's a beautiful way to take that step, to participate and actively respond and to come to the table as a way of marking that step of faith, that you put your trust in Jesus, that you recognize him for who he is. So we're going to take communion now. We're going to enter a time of response. We're going to keep reflecting. Uh, you're going to come forward. Uh, there's, there's a table here. There's a table or a step here. And there's a table at the back. Come forward or back. Uh, take bread. Take, take the grape juice. Um, go back to your seats or spend some time in the prayer zone. And in your own time, eat and drink. The band will will continue to be playing and, and Kenny will again take over and lead us through this time of response. Friends, Jesus is the true bridegroom. He laid down his life for you so that you can have a seat at the table. And so come and receive the body of Christ which is broken for you and the blood of Christ which is shed for you. Amen.